Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Medical Cannabis Research at Drexel University. Happy to be joined today by Meredith Buettner, the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Cannabis Coalition. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Meredith over the past few years, um, certainly talking about how um, policy is impacting research and certainly um, the medical cannabis community as a whole. Um, very glad to have you today, Meredith, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Jim. I am happy to be here. Um, as Jim mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Pennsylvania Cannabis Coalition. Um, we represent approximately 70% of the permit holders in the current medical marijuana program. We also have some ancillary um, dependent businesses who are members of our organization as well. Um, and we are focused on uh, both legislative and regulatory advocacy as it is related to the medical marijuana program here in Pennsylvania. And we are also focused on um, legalizing cannabis here in the Commonwealth for uh, for use by adults 21 and over. So those are our primary objectives um, as the PCC. Um, so I will... Um, you want me to just jump in and I'll run through this first slide and then we'll talk about what's on it? Okay, cool. All right, I, I promise I don't have a lot of luxury slides. They're just to prompt our conversation. So um, so Jim asked me to talk about a little bit about what's going on um, legislatively as it relates to um, as it relates to cannabis here in the Commonwealth. So I broke this down into a couple different categories, uh, different um, by chamber and by legislation type. So just talk real quickly about um, stuff in the pipeline for the medical cannabis program. Um, there's always a conversation going on about patients' rights here in Pennsylvania. Um, and by rights, I mean their ability to use their medicine without suffering consequences for that. Um, so you'll often see, and you have seen almost every legislative session since the Medical Marijuana Act passed in 20, um, in 2016, you've seen a series of bills um, focused on those things. So for example, um, employment protections for patients, tenant protections for patients, um, as well as changes to make the program easier for patients, um, such as the uh, Representative Guzman's bill, the first on the list here, which um, would make some changes to the way that patients' identification cards work. Um, one of the criticisms that we often hear about the program um, is that it is expensive and the barrier to entry for patients is high because of that cost related to not only the card, but to the certification as well. So there has been some efforts this legislative session to do a couple things. Um, one, do away with recurring certifications. Um, so, you know, get certified once and then you're part of the program forever. Um, and also and or to extend the time period on your medical cannabis card um, from one year to maybe two, three, four. Um, you know, we renew our driver's license here in Pennsylvania every four years. So is that the benchmark that we should be looking at? Um, should we be making considerations for folks that have a chronic or terminal um, illness because their, you know, their diagnosis isn't going to change? So a lot of those conversations um, occur on a really regular basis. Um, we have seen several times um, in um, Senator, or I'm sorry, Representative Deloso's bill that's listed on this list here, um, that bill about workers' compensation coverage. And interestingly enough, earlier this year, um, the Commonwealth Court decided, or I'm sorry, the Supreme Court decided that um, here in Pennsylvania that the cost of medical cannabis is reimbursable. Um, it is not covered per se by insurance, but it is considered a reimbursable expense under workman's comp. Um, Representative Deloso's bill would codify that decision. Um, I, I don't, while I'm not sure it is something we'll see happen this legislative session, I think the filing of it is a signal that it is, it is a long-term goal of, of the legislature to consider the coverage of medical cannabis for patients. Um, 
And then these last two bills, and I must have hit delete on the description of Representative Rigby's bill here, but um, these last two bills deal with the expansion of the licenses in the medical cannabis programs in, in two very different mechanisms. Um, Representative Schusterman's bill have generally dealt with the extension of grower processor permits for uh, for farmers um, and and are focused on uh, on a micro grow model for folks in the agricultural community that may want to get into the ca medical cannabis space. Um, Representative Rigby's bill um, deals with um, what we what we is easiest e most easily described as a vertical integration issue. Um, for those of you familiar with Pennsylvania's medical cannabis program, we have a we have a grow processor permits and then we have dispensary permits. When a company has both, we refer to them as vertically integrated because they have um, assets to grow cannabis but also sell cannabis. Um, Representative Rigby's bill dealt with um, allowing companies that aren't vertically integrated to become vertically integrated. Um, that bill was considered by the House Health Committee um, and, and didn't make it out of the House. House it, it it lives with the House Health Committee, but it has not been voted on. So um, there could be movement on that because it has been assigned to a committee. Um, but I think for a variety of reasons, um, we're not sure exactly what will happen with that bill. So. Um, so that's that's the House and the medical program. Jim, do you want me to do the Senate and the medical program, or do you want to talk about some of these right now? Yeah, I'm just curious about which ones are going to be, or at least you see from your perspective, as ones that kind of have um, either most urgent need or kind of a realistic shot of passing, and kind of maybe who might be some of the people holding that up or what um, parts of the legislature might be holding that up and, and why. Sure. So I think our biggest challenge right now has nothing to do even with cannabis as a topic, um, but has to deal with a very uh, short legislative session this fall with very few actual legislative days. Um, and also we're up against the fact that our uh, legislature still has not completed the legislation they need to complete for the budget to be finalized. Um, the budget was due on June 30th, so they're very, very tardy in getting this done. Um, and I anticipate that that conversation will that will take up the legislative days that are left in this calendar year. Um, but we do have a two-year legislative calendar here in Pennsylvania, so all of these bills are still alive until November of 2024 when we elect a, a new legislature and or new members to the legislature and legislature and start a new session. Um, so anything's possible, right? Um, I think. There are several issues here that have traction in both parties and in both chambers of the legislature. So those are going to be the ones that are most likely to get done. Um, you'll see when we get to the Senate slide that there's companion bills for some of these issues, right? So when both leg when both chambers of the legislature are thinking about something, it's going to be more likely to get done. Um, I think one here that I'll point out, I think the the changes to the medical marijuana patient cards um, is something that a lot of legislators are hearing about from their constituents who are patients. Um, and, and it's something that kind of a, a lot of stakeholders agree is a, a barrier to entry to the program. Um, I think it's going to take it's going to take some conversations to make sure that there's consensus about how to address those issues. Um, but I think there is a desire amongst the legislature legislature to do something about that. Um, so I think, you know, when I look at this list, that is probably the um, I think the one that has the most traction right now. Great. And in terms of. Uh just seeing uh, Representative Rab's bill for continuing education for certifying physicians. Certainly like to ask a similar question to that. For those of you in the audience who don't know why this might be an issue, um, endocannabinoid system is something that's relatively recent in at least medicine. Um, 
even more so than kind of cannabis being used as a medicine, certainly cannabis being in the pharmacopoeia in uh, the early 1900s. Um, but uh, the endocannabinoid system was essentially really discovered in the early 90s. There's a 2017 NIH study that showed that 85% of medical residents did not receive um, any sort of training in the endocannabinoid system, which is naturally occurring within the human body. So can you talk a little bit about Representative Rab's bill um, about if that kind of has a realistic shot or kind of how that's seen by the industry? So the industry would certainly be supportive of that, right? We are dealing with the ever-changing science around cannabis on, on a daily basis in, in, in our businesses, right? And it's really important that um, patients are, um, you know, building relationships with physicians who are knowledgeable about this. I think part of the issue here is we're waiting for that available education to catch up, right? It, Jim, like you just said, like there are a lot of medical school curriculums that are not that are not including it. Um, we're really lucky here in Pennsylvania that our medical schools are directly engaged with our medical cannabis program through the academic clinical research center um, and clinical registrant uh, permit held by um, right now held by that. I'm sorry, eight um, held by eight of the soon to be 10 states medical colleges. Um, so we're lucky here that our institutions have engaged with the program. And I think we're, we're probably um, top notch for providing medical students access to education about, uh, about the program and about the endocannabinoid system. Um, but I think from an industry perspective, you know, should, should Representative Rab's bill um, get traction, it certainly would be something, you know, we could be supportive of. Um, I think something like that takes advocacy from folks other than industry. Um, I think it takes advocacy from patients and and also advocacy from physicians groups um, who are who are interested in ensuring that their their members are probably educated on this area of of medicine that 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 they're practicing in. Um, you know, it certainly would be something that we would, you know, consider talking to those groups about. Um, I would say right now we haven't seen Representative Rab's bill um, on an agenda for a committee meeting. We've seen it assigned to a committee, um, but we haven't necessarily seen it come up. I, I think something that's really it, unique to Pennsylvania um, is that once a bill on any given subject matter um, becomes active, there's a, an ability to, you know, kind of pile on to it, right? So Act 16 is our, is our medical cannabis law. Anytime we open Act 16, the legislature has the ability to amend it in a variety of different ways. So let's say um, Representative Guzman's bill about the identification cards got a lot of traction, um, Representative Rab could could offer his bill as an amendment to that bill, which would then both amend Act 16. So, you know, once you get, and I think when we get to the Senate slide, you'll see a little bit of this too, that there is an opportunity for some of these priorities to come together to make a really effective bill. Great. Yeah, let's move on to those Senate bills. And okay. All right, so I kind of went backwards here. So um, Senator Gebhard's bill deals with the same thing as Representative Rab's bill, which is this vertical integration issue. Um, this is a really divisive in issue for the industry. Um, our organization has taken a neutral position on this bill because there are folks um, with very different opinions on the bill, and um, you know we're still we're still working through that. Um, but that bill is currently was voted out of the Senate um, with a bipartisan vote and went over to the House, and that bill now lives with the House Health Committee. Um, so we are, we have not seen that sketch we have not seen them schedule that for a vote, but in terms of like prognosis for this bill, I think there is a chance that we see the house health committee deal with it in their limited session days and send something back to the, um, send something back to the Senate. Um, 
Next, this is another one of those patient rights issues that has been addressed several sessions in a row, but it does not, um, it hasn't, it hasn't ever reached the, the stage of getting a vote. Um, the interesting thing about Senator Bartolotta's bill removing DUI penalties for legal metal, medical cannabis use is this bill doesn't deal with Act 16, right? It it actually deals with Title 75, which is the motor vehicle code, because that's where that's where our patients face an issue when it comes to um, having their medicine in their system should they be pulled over for DUI, DUID. So this bill is one that affects a very different code than most of the, the cannabis bills that we're dealing with. I think if there is a viable uh, Title 75 bill that deals with the motor vehicle code, that there's a chance that we see this move. Um, I also do think there's a chance that we see this move as a standalone bill. Um, we've seen um, we've seen Senator Senator Bartolotta become a little bit more active in um, the cannabis space over the last several weeks. Um, she actually voted no on a bill because it didn't include home grow rights for patients. Um, to me, that that her standing up and saying that um, has really identified her as a true advocate of the medical cannabis program. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that we'll see some umph out of her office on getting this one done too, because this is um, the, the, the risk of DUI from using your medical cannabis is, is probably with, with the exception of the cost for the medical cannabis cards. This is probably the, the second thing that I hear the most about from, from patients. Um, so hopefully we get we get that one moving. Um, Senator Regan's bill here, the Medical Marijuana Act updates. So this bill does what I was what I was talking about. It amends Act 16 in a variety of ways. It deals with a bunch of issues at once. Um, we we passed a, a bill similar to that in the summer of 2021, and we're going to talk about that on our on our next slide, but we really looked at that package as a modernization package for the program. So the act was passed in 2016. Until 2021, no changes had been made to the law. Now, a lot of laws we pass in the Commonwealth, that that's to be expected that we wouldn't make any kind of amendment to it over, um, you know, over that long of a period. But remember, as we're talking about, the science is ever ch is ever changing, policy is changing, people's views of cannabis are changing. So it was a really long time for that act to go out without an update. Um, so what we've seen Senator Regan try to do here is put together like a second version of putting some, some of these things together. It, it deals with everything from um, some of the verticality issues to the medical um, the patient card issues, um, to the conditions list, to edibles. It does quite a lot. Um, that bill was voted out of the Senate Law and Justice Committee, but it hasn't been taken up by the full Senate. Um, there is a chance that it could be taken up by the full Senate before the end of the year. Um, but again, that pesky budget is still in the way and they've got to get that done. And there are just very few. I know we're all sitting here saying it's only October, but there are very few session days left before the end of the year. Um, so. So Meredith, for that bill, SB 835, um, yeah. my understanding is that that would actually eliminate the 24 qualifying conditions. And, and is there any kind of concern or pushback that, that's kind of been voiced around that? Yeah, so I think that that's definitely a, a conversation that's going on all the time. Um, you know, I think there are folks that would like to see the condition list eliminated and just leave that decision completely up to a certifying physician and a patient. Um, there are other folks that would like to see, um, you know, kind of what I said added as a condition. So we would have 23 conditions and then number 24 would be or any condition seen fit, you know, by a certifying physician. Um, and some of the reason behind that is because it it it's still 
uh, prioritizes things, right. And, and allows there to be, I guess, natural diagnoses for things, you know, like that, a, that a certifying physician is, is able to verify, um, via paperwork that the patient submits. Um, but at the same time, it gives some, it gives some flexibility. Um, one example I, I like to give is, um, someone who has like TMJ, right. And, um, it may not necessarily qualify them for the condition of chronic pain, but it might be something that provides them relief. Um, and and right now, the mechanism for them to apply for that to be a condition is so cumbersome that it could be two years before that condition was approved. So it's not it's not efficient for patients and doctors to do that. So it, by adding some flexibility into the language, um, you, you could do that. Um, I think there'll be a lot of pushback on making any of those changes um, from a lot of the more conservative folks. Um, and, and because there is already a mechanism to add conditions, which I just kind of alluded to, um, patients, advocates, industry, we can put together a um, a proposal for a new condition to be added. And then that goes in front of the Medical Marijuana Advisory Board, who makes a recommendation to um, add a condition. And then based on their recommendation, the Secretary of Health can add a condition to the program. We've seen, we've seen a few done that, um, done that way. We just... Earlier this year, they approved chronic hepatitis C to be added to the list of conditions via that proposal. Um, you know, we also saw um, anxiety added that way, and I'm going to forget off the top of my head, but a couple others were added that way too. Um, the legislature codified them when we did Act 44. So, you know, you'll see 23 conditions, I think, and then chronic um, hepatitis C wasn't codified. So again, that's something that we could stick in like Senator Regan's bill, right? Just codifying that one condition. You could do, he could do that, right? And just make a regular process to codify conditions um, and do it that way. But it, it certainly, um, while I think it's something that um, folks would like to see. I don't think that that will be without controversy when, when the bill goes in front of the legislature. So. Great. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of um, what are some of the concerns that are being um, uh, for Senator Street's bill uh, 869 uh, for home grow, certainly hearing that that's kind of really the, the big thing for medical cannabis patients um, the common thing that I hear from, from talking with patients, um, whether they're involved in our research or whether they're um, just people interested in learning about the research is that um, they have a particular strain or um, particular product that is not in stock. Uh, certainly growing seasons are, are very tricky and certainly with a finite amount of growing space, um, plants will come and go. Um, what kind of barriers are seen as that? Um, whether that's through a standalone bill or through um, kind of overall legalization bills? Yeah, so I think there's two paths for home grow, right? There's a path for home grow in kind of a omnibus medical program bill where there could be a, a, a scope of home grow allowed for medical cannabis patients. Um, I do think there could be an opportunity for that to happen here. I think it depends on if you see something like Senator Regan's bill move um, or one of these other bills that deals with more than one issue move. Um, you could see that happen. Um, I mentioned before um, that Senator Bartolotta, um, you know, voted, she actually voted against Senator Gebhard's bill 773 because um, home grow was not included. So what happened was Senator Street offered, uh, uh, you know, filed the home grow amendment to that bill. He ended up tabling it himself, um, which, which actually, in terms of like how our process here works here in Pennsylvania, it, it keeps the amendment alive. So it could be resurrected at any time. If they had brought the amendment up and the amendment failed, 
it can't be brought up again as written. It has would have to be refiled and you'd have to make a change to it to get to do it again. So procedurally, it keeps it alive. So, you know, being added to the right bill, I think, is a, is an, is a real path for home grow. Um, where I do think home grow ends up, and this is just a personal opinion, but I think it ends up happening as part of a comprehensive adult use bill. Um, in which we um, legalize cannabis, but we also bring the medical program with us, right? So we have one program in like a dual use situation where we we still have a medical program, but we have access to legalized cannabis for adults 21 and over. Um, and in a comprehensive bill like that, you would reserve home grow rights for registered patients. Um, it's how we've seen some other states roll it out. So it still provides some kind of regulatory oversight to the home grow portion because it is a registered patient. Um, and I think that, you know, we've seen that in Senator um, Street and Lachlan's adult use bill. Um, and, and I think it would be very unlikely that we would see an adult use bill that didn't include home grow rights for patients. Great. And, and so coming from the public health perspective, um, certainly there have been a lot of a lot of talk around cannabis, hemp, um, and kind of one of the common issues that people have with it is that there are so many variables that go into growing your own cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, the cleanliness of the soil with heavy metals, the mold, pesticides, all, all the criticisms of really the industry when it first started. Has there been any talk about, uh, and kind of at least what I've heard is um, education is always the solution. Has there been any talk about including some sort of licensing or education training on how to do it safely and effectively to ensure that patients are are growing clean and, and mm -hmm. um, quality cannabis? Yeah, that that's certainly interesting. I I don't believe that there's been any um like discussion of statute around that. I think that something like that might live more in regulations, but the statute would need to tell the regulator to do it. So, you know, I, I actually like now my wheels are spinning about where that would need to go. Um, but I think that's, you know, I think that that's a really great thing to point out. We're often more focused on, um, we're often, and when I say I'm using a universal way when we're having policy discussions about cannabis, but we're often more focused on um, like uh, protecting like protecting the public from it being distributed to them, um, protecting children that live in the home from having access to it, you know, making sure we don't create a secondary, uh, a secondary retail market. Um, in Michigan, when they allowed home grow, they didn't do it in, um, I don't, strict is not the word I'm looking for. They didn't regulate it quite enough. And they ended up creating a secondary market where the caregivers that were growing cannabis were then like selling it to their patients, right? And and the intent here is of a home grow piece is to make sure that patients have access to, to strains and, and cost-effective medicine for themselves, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know that the bill has contemplated that. And I think it's, um, I think it's certainly worth raising. And, and I will say certainly one of the reasons I am really, um, I'm really thankful that our state has these partnerships with the academic clinical research centers because um, there are folks like you thinking about it from more of a public health perspective than a nuts and bolts perspective. And I think that's really important for getting cannabis policy right the first time and not having to go back and correct it and correct it and correct it. So I'm going to, I'm making a note of that and we'll talk about that offline too, how we could make sure <laughs> that gets done. So um, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, um, in terms of the co-sponsorship co memos, um, can you tell us a little bit more about those and kind of what those would mean? Sure. So Senator Schwank and Senator Street um, have been talking about, you know, the oversight of Kratom and then some of um, the hemp derived products that are out there, particularly Delta 8 um, and, and CBD is, is looped in there as well. 
Um, we've not really seen a lot from them about where they're looking for, um, where they're looking to do this or how they're looking to do this. I think the concern is we, a lot of legislators are hearing from their constituents about, uh, smoke shops, Delta eight shops and things like that. And there's also a lot of confusion about what is legal and what isn't legal, um, we've seen district attorneys in several counties around the Commonwealth take action against some of these businesses um, because they feel like they are selling illegal products. Um, this all comes back to our friends in Washington um, who have more issues on their hands than we do in Pennsylvania's legislature right now. Legislature right now, so I'm not sure they're going to figure this one out anytime soon. But a lot of this goes back to um, what folks call the farm bill loophole, um, which classifies um, anything with less than 0.3% uh, THC as hemp and anything over it as marijuana. Um, and what is happening is just like we're learning more and more about the endocannabinoid system every day, we're also learning more about these molecules every day and folks are taking that the raw plant with less than 0.3% THC and converting it into Delta 9, the active ingredient in cannabis that is the ingredient that gets you high, um, but are saying that because they create the plant they started with started as a federally legal plant that their final product is also federally legal. So there's a lot of debate around this issue. Um, there's also a lot of good actors in the space, but there's a lot of bad actors in the space. And, and unfortunately, uh, um, that's kind of the situation that we're in. Um, you know, I, I, I think we will see movement on this soon. Um, I think there's some desire to wait and see what happens in the farm bill. But I'm not sure we're going to see a farm bill before it becomes um, becomes really pertinent for our legislature to deal with this. All right. So this is I mentioned we did and we won't we won't read through all this. We can talk about some specifics that you guys might be interested in. But um, in the summer of 2021, we passed um, House Bill 1024, which became Act 44 of 2021. Um, and this bill did a, like two dozen changes to the medical cannabis bill and really, you know, sought to modernize it um, as the program um, grew. So, um, you know, there's some things that were more mechanical. Um, for example, the bill allows operators to bring new genetics in every year during a 30 day window. Um, prior to this, we had not had we had not had permission to bring new genetics into the state. So you're only um, you're only able to work with the strains you brought in when you originally operationalized. Um, and, and so we now have an annual window where we can do that. Um, but we also were able to um, the the Department of Health now allows operators to request a, a, a window at another time as well. Um, and folks might say, why do you need to do it more than, you know, once a year? Um, sometimes a strain becomes really popular um, in kind of cannabis culture. And if you as a grower have a lead on getting your hands on it, um, you know, you want to bring it to market as soon as as soon as possible. So so often, you know, we'll see folks um, folks do that. And we, we got permission to do that. Um, another thing that we, we did was worked with our friends in the Pennsylvania hemp community, um, to create a pathway for hemp derived ingredients to be brought into the medical marijuana program. Um, we've seen a couple companies be able to successfully do this. It's taken a while for all the regulatory parts to work out about how we're actually going to do it. But um, this is really great news for patients for a couple reasons. One, it allows operators to produce more um, CBD dominant 
products. Um, and we, we see a lot of patients looking for those. Um, and it also allows operators to do that at at much less of a cost that must be passed on to patients. Um, we can't grow them in the same room or they could um, impact each other. So by being able to purchase CBD uh, ingredients and hemp ingredients and bring them into our facilities um, and add them during the manufacturing process, manufacturing stage, um, um, we're able to produce products that patients want and at a, at, you know, at a lower cost than just producing CBD dominant products that are really expensive and, and often um, go out of supply because they are in high demand. So that was one that was, you know, uh, that was super important and um, I'm really, really proud of. Um, and then I'll just highlight the last one and then I'll take any questions on any of this, but um one thing the original act did was anyone who had been convicted of any uh, level of crime related to drugs, cannabis, um, they were not allowed to seek employment in the industry. Um, and this goes all the way down to, you know, if you got caught smoking a joint in college, you weren't allowed to work in the industry. Um, and a lot of those folks were really interested in working in the industry. Um, and we would run into situations where we would want to hire somebody and we, because of the background check that we are obligated to produce for the state, we weren't allowed to hire those folks. So we said, this isn't right. Um, and we were able to take that piece out of out of the law. Um, so anybody with a uh, misdemeanor related to um, drugs, et cetera, is now allowed to seek employment in the program. Um, and also those who have been convicted of a nine, a nonviolent felony um, who have, who's, who's can, who have satisfied their sentence and there's been a 10 year period afterwards, they are also allowed to seek um, employment in the industry. So, um, you know, the the social equity conversation and social justice conversation that is so tied to cannabis policy was not the forefront of, of Act 16, right? The forefront of Act 16 was really mama bears trying to get medicine for their kids that really desperately needed it. And the, and the policy conversation has really shifted. And by the time we got to the summer of 2021, um, it, it became something we were really focused on. And it was something small that we, um, it was something small that we could accomplish through a legislative change in the current act. So um, that was really a priority as well. So, um, but I'm happy to take questions about any, any of this stuff. There are any. Yeah, everyone, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them as they come in. Um, I definitely wanted to kind of dive in a little bit more to SB 846 being the Comprehensive Legalization Bill um, and kind of figure out a little bit about more what kind of is being talked about within the industry as well as kind of how it kind of takes into account public health concerns. Um, but definitely wanted to give you the floor about kind of SB 846. Yeah, sure. So um, I always like to kick off conversation about legalization with, you know, why should why should we legalize, right? And there there's, uh, I won't read through these, but you can all see them on your screen. But there's a lot of a lot of reasons to legalize, right? Not just because folks want to purchase it, um, but we save public resources and and all these things. And you know, at the bottom of that list, we can talk about the need for the need for revenue and and how that impacts the state's budget as well. Um, but I will say, Senator Street and Senator Lachlan have put together a like two hundred and thirty some page bill. Um, it is a really truly a comprehensive approach to legalization here in the Commonwealth. Um, the and um, Jim, I'm going to cheat off your questions and talk through these things. But so um, the bill establishes a new regulator for cannabis. Um, currently, the medical cannabis program is regulated under the Department of Health. Um, 
once the once we would go to a dual use program with um, adult use can you know adult use cannabis access for folks 21 and over and a medical program you know there's a lot of conversations about is the department of health still the right place for a program to live or should it be a different regulator so senator street and senator lachlan's bill establishes um, a cannabis control board that's set up similar to how our gaming control board is set up here in Pennsylvania. Um, so an entirely new regulatory body with a full-time board and full-time staff to execute the program. Um, the bill also picks up the medical program out of the Department of Health and puts it under the new regulatory body um, and still, you know, maintains the patient focus of, of that part um, while moving like the regulatory business matters under, you know, the full scope of the board um, and does establish a chief medical officer to continue to oversee the medical program. Um, so that's really where the regulatory authority um, lies in that bill. Um, I will tell you there is a, another kind of proposal being talked about right now um, that would potentially put the regulatory authority for cannabis under the Liquor Control Board. So it could potentially become the Liquor and Cannabis Control Board. Um, we've seen other states do this. A lot of times they have their agencies are like alcohol, tobacco, and they add cannabis. Um, as everybody in Pennsylvania knows, we have this very unique liquor model here. Um, so there's a thought, should we should we insert a new um, regulated industry and talk uh, and a new intoxicant to the right to into the system that already knows how to regulate intoxicants? Um, so that's another proposal that's being talked about. There's pros and cons of that. Um, I, I will say what isn't being talked about is leaving the regulatory authority with the Department of Health. That's not necessarily something that I think anybody is drafting. Um, possession, possession limits are often something that is sought when um, we're thinking about trying to keep the bill conservative enough for our folks on even the Republican side of the aisle to, to consider the bill. Um, it's something that a lot of um, prohibitionist groups support for or um, push for. I think, you know, we've seen some states establish possession limits um, that have worked better and others that have not worked at all. They've just driven people to back to the, um, you know, back to the legacy market and, and don't pull them into the legal market, the regulated market. Um, so, you know, I think... We want to be thinking about that and we want to be thinking about um, what our neighbors are doing too when when it be, when it comes to possession limits. Um, you know, sometimes you see um, a bill set um, smaller limits for adult use while allowing patients, you know, un, I don't want to say unfettered, but right now we're patients are allowed access to a 90 day supply. Um, could we see the legislature use something like that as part of a compromise? I think we could, but right now that that's not the case. Um, in terms of protections for minors, which is always a conversation that, that we're having, um, let me see if this helps real quick. Sorry, guys. There we go. Um, a conversation we're always having. And, and as a mom, it's a conversation I care an awful lot about. Um, when we see well-regulated cannabis programs, um, you know, we see things like ensuring packaging is not attractive to minors, ensuring that packaging is childproof. I'd argue some of our packaging here in the Commonwealth is adult proof too, because um, it's hard to get into, but making sure that the actual packaging is not attractive to children, that the um, actual products are not attractive to children, um, making sure that it is, um, making sure that it isn't advertised in places where the audience is primarily children, all of those things are included in the bill um, and, and are something that are, um, you know, something that are really crucially important to to any kind of cannabis, can, comprehensive cannabis bill. Um, 
something else Jim had wanted me to talk about was ex- expunging nonviolent offenses. Um, the bill does deal with that. It sets up a timeline for all the agencies that need to talk to each other to talk to each other, which I think is something that's really critical. Um, we've seen some folks really well intentioned um, in their cannabis bills say we're going to do expungement, but then they have no plan to actually do it. Um, this bill establishes timelines for state police to talk to courts, courts to talk to who they need to talk to um, and ensure that this happens in in what I think is a is a um a good time frame. I think you know you've got 30 days to do this, 60 days to do this, 30 days to do this. So it, it establishes a timeline, um, which I think is one of the most important parts. Like saying you're gonna do it is fantastic, but actually doing it is what really needs to be done. So um the bill does the bill does do that. Um, the bill does currently include home grow for patients. We talked about that a little bit. Um, in terms of taxes, right now the bill has an effective tax rate of 13%. Um, from an industry perspective, I think 13% is great. Um, it is high enough that it will provide revenue um, for the Commonwealth. It is also low enough that it won't price folks out of the regulated market. Um, I do think there will be pushback on the tax rate. Um, we saw Governor Shapiro um, in his budget address propose a 20% effective tax rate. Um, which is entirely too high and will keep people in the legacy market and keep them from coming into the regulated market. Um, But that was the number he felt was necessary to produce um, the revenue he's eyeing from the industry. So I think there will be some conversation there. Um, But I think um, I, I, I don't know if it'll be 13, but I don't think it will be 20. So that's my that's my best my best guess on that. Um, <clears throat> the licensing structure of this bill is super interesting. Um, it uses the existing medical marijuana operators as an on ramp to ensure that sales happen quickly and ensure that you know we're um, providing safe legal access to the product as quickly as possible. Um, The bill then establishes a social equity program in which um, licensed operators would partner with social equity applicants to open up additional stores. Um, And then the bill contemplates some other license types, micro grows, other dispensary licenses, and things like that. Um, While the bill doesn't have hard license caps in it, it does um, establish like metered uh, permit caps. So like the department can only issue this many licenses at a time. So it's like a measured rollout. Um, All of those things, I think, are things that are um, in play when it comes to negotiating this bill. Um, I don't think you take a 230 page bill and expect it to come back looking exactly like you filed it. I think you're going to see some major comprehensive amendments t- to the bill. So, you have a uh, question in the chat, Meredith, um, from Crystal Bush. Uh, she's actually on one of our advisory boards. It's been yes. uh, very great for us. Um, could you please share some insights on the best practices for effective collaboration um, with multi state operator government affairs and, and, or even with you in terms of the process of developing bill language? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we certainly have been working with all of our members to give to give our feedback on the bill. Um, you know, I I am always open to conversations and feedbacks um, from advocates about the legislation. Um, I, I think, Crystal, the most important thing I think is if you care about legalization in Pennsylvania to get on your computer and read the bill. I think there's a lot of people um, who probably haven't read the bill um, and are supportive of it and wouldn't even be sure where to start a conversation. Um, I'm I'm happy to, you know, point everybody in the right direction on that. Um, but I do think, um, I do think that's important. Um, I also do think that 
there's going to be an opportunity at some point for stakeholders to come together and it not just be the um be the companies who have lobbyists in Harrisburg to have this conversation. I think there has to be some other folks. And, you know, I'm just thinking of Crystal, I feel like I just saw you, but you know, like I I think folks like myself who represent the majority of the permit holders in Pennsylvania are MSOs you know, attending the the Black Cannabis Week conversations last week were so insightful. And I'm taking those conversations back to my team. Um, and when folks are listening to calls like this and they're taking those conversations back to that to their teams, that's I think how we how we really get this done. Um I think we're still, despite having a bill filed I think we are still at the stage where members are interested in hearing from stakeholders about this um, and that there will be a lot of um, influence from stakeholders on whatever the final product looks like. So, Great. And in terms of um, this legalization bill, whether it's um, micro grows or certain social equity licenses, has there been any talk of, I know some states have taken action in terms of those sec social equity licenses cannot be sold or transferred. Has any of those conversations been had? I uh, certainly know it's been a kind of controversial one. Yeah, um, I, I think there have been initial conversations. I think part of the problem when we talk about social equity is we don't necessarily have another state that we can point to that has gotten it 100% correct. So it really comes down to looking at what has worked in other states and what hasn't worked in other states, and then also applying that to the current situation in Pennsylvania um, and, and figuring out what'll work best there. I do think the social equity conversation is one that's going to continue to um, be a major part of this discussion about about the adult use bill. Um, also, remember that we haven't seen yet a true comprehensive adult use product on from the House of Representatives. We've only seen it from the Senate. Um, and in the Senate, you know, it's a it's a Republican controlled Senate. So even if it's a bipartisan piece of legislation, you're drafting with the thought that we're trying to make sure that we get enough Republican votes to kick it out. We're in a different situation in the House now. We have the Democrats in charge for the first time in a long time, um, you know, and previous iterations of adult use bills that we've seen have dealt with social equity differently than Senator Street and Senator Lachlan's bill does. So I think as we see a bill come out of the House in the next couple months, um, that it will deal with it in a different manner. And then you end up in a situation where, you know, it, it probably wouldn't officially be a conf called a conference committee like they do in Washington, but you would be in some kind of situation where you would be negotiating the bills at the same time to come up with a final product. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of, you know, how long they can be sold for, what the ownership percentages have to be, if there's a social equity fund, if we're doing giving access to low interest loans, like all of the particulars, I think any idea you have, let's throw it out there and talk about it. I don't think that I don't I don't necessarily think that uh, um, that conversation's done being had. Great. So I do have a few more questions here. I know we're kind of <laughs> bumping up on time. I'll do them rapid, I promise. <laughs> so just wanted to see, has there been any talk about creating any sort of carve outs for future interstate commerce? I know that that's something that uh, Governor Murphy, Murphy just uh, passed in New Jersey. Wanted to see if that's being talked about in PA. Yeah, so Act 16 had a sunshine clause in it that would basically put the dispensaries out of business when federal legalization happened. We took that out um, of the bill. Um, the, this bill does not comprehend interstate commerce um, to any significant extent. Um, you know, I, I think it'll be something that we'll have to contemplate really quickly if there is um, if there is legalization at the federal level. But even if there's rescheduling or descheduling at the federal level, I think we need to start thinking about it more quickly. Um, 
it's certainly something that myself and my membership think about, but I don't know that there's been a lot of thought given to that um, when we think about, you know, when we think about it from a legislative perspective. Great. And a couple more kind of public health focused uh, questions um, in the legalization bill, or at least in conversations being had about it, are there any restrictions um, on where you can consume? And then as well, kind of protections for renters and drug testing for jobs. I know that those were kind of separate bills in the House for um, medical program, but also thinking forward towards uh, adult use legalization. Yeah, some of of those, some of those things are contemplated. Certainly, you know, public consumption, um, you know, I think is, I think it's more modeled after like liquor consumption than um, anything else, right? Like you can consume it in your home, um, things like that. The, um, I, I don't think the bill creates a situation where folks are going to be walking down the street smoking a joint. I just don't, I don't think Pennsylvania is ready for that. Um, But, you know, I I will say the bill does not directly contemplate consumption lounges. It gives the board the authority to to contemplate consumption lounges. Um, So, you know, that is another license that we don't necessarily know what it would end up looking like when it comes to this bill in particular, because it's not laid out in statute. It is reserved for the regulatory body to do. Um, You know, whether the bill effectively deals with what I would consider, like right now we talk about them as like the patient's rights issues um you know it 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 thinks about those things but i i don't know that it's spent as much time on them as someone like representative rab has who's really spent a lot of time thinking about this so i think you know someone like representative rab has it will will have an opportunity to influence some of those pieces of the bill during the conversation about adult use right um you know and that's that's one of the things that i think will be addressed more with a more critical eye when when we get to that point of the conversation great and i know that you mentioned kind of descheduling but specifically as we look at the pennsylvania medical marijuana program um with a potential rescheduling or descheduling on the horizon, um, do you see at all there being a push to move to a um, prescription model, which is what Schedule 3 would require, or just kind of business as usual? Yeah, I don't know. That's going to be a really tough one. Um, particularly here in Pennsylvania, I think it can't be underestimated how strong our cannabis infrastructure here is in Pennsylvania. I mean, we've got like 35 companies growing. We have 180 dispensaries that are operationalized. So to completely change the way of doing business to go to a prescription model where only a uh, only a retailer who's authorized to sell Schedule Three drugs is allowed to sell cannabis. Would you know? Up, would up put our program into upheaval? It would just be. It would be disastrous. So I, I don't. I don't know what the thought is there. Um, from an industry perspective, I think we would prefer to see cannabis descheduled um, than we would see it rescheduled to Schedule Three. Um, but at the same time, that Schedule 3 does relieve some of the pain points of the industry, right? It makes the banking conversation easier. It makes the 280E tax burden conversation easier. Um, you know, it might even uh, it might even change the opinion of some legislators that have been on the fence about adult use and about medical cannabis and where they stand because this this position had the position of its efficacy and use for for medical purposes has changed. Um, but I don't think, Jim, I don't think folks are thinking about that yet. And, you know, a, a um, you know, it, it's there's a timeline for a decision being made at the federal level. So it's something that folks should probably be thinking about, myself included, should be thinking about it more than we are. Great. Well, if there are any last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, give you another minute to do that. Um, Thanks again, Meredith, just in case we don't have any more here, but definitely learned a lot myself in terms of the house side of things. Um, Tends to be a little bit um, disjointed in terms of how bills are covered and what the conversation is like in terms of uh, between the House and the Senate. And that certainly kind of also seems that not everyone will be on the same page. So definitely looking forward to staying in touch and 
um, following more about what the industry um, is doing, as well as kind of legislative up updates. Um, definitely we'll be in touch. And thanks again for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for having me and um, feel free to reach out with any questions that we didn't get a chance to address today. All right, great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.